Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. The personal impact of what the Bear County Deputy Sheriff's Association calls, quote, low morale and unreasonable working conditions, end quote, are outlined in a study in the association released today. Poor staffing, they say the study shows, has triggered physical, mental, and safety concerns among the deputies. Paul Venema with more on that study and the sheriff's reaction. Nearly 60% of Bear County Sheriff's deputies are dissatisfied with their working conditions at the jail and on the streets. That's according to the Bear County Deputy Sheriff's Association. They attribute the numbers to an independent study conducted by Dr. Stacy Speedlin, a sociologist and commissioned by the association. Among the deputies' complaints, forced overtime. They're working overtime because we have to be in compliance with jail standards. If you've got X number of inmates under roof, then you've got to have X number of deputies under roof. The study claims that long hours and challenging working conditions at the jail are leading to an increase in domestic issues, including divorce. I'd rather be able to send them home to spend time with their family, but, but if we can't do that because we have to comply with the law, then at least I'll make sure you get paid. The sheriff said that some deputies are making well over $100,000 a year in overtime. He said that running a jail during the pandemic is difficult. So is staffing. So our problem is not um, uh, hiring or recruitment, it's retention. The problems, as serious as they are, are not peculiar to the Sheriff's Department, according to Salazar. The issues plague law enforcement everywhere. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. Deputies are trying to figure out the motive behind a woman being shot and killed while out road roller skating in East Bear County. Sheriff Javier Salazar identified the victim as 24-year-old Giovanna Barrera. The shooting happened in the 7600 block of Terrassa. The sheriff says a man walked up to Barrera and eventually shot her at close range. She was pronounced dead at the scene. Right now, deputies are looking for two suspects who they believe might be driving a black Chevy HHR with distinctive rims. Anyone with information is asked to call Crime Stoppers at the number there on your screen, 210-224-STOP. The Bear County deputies also investigating a deadly shooting, this one happening near Loop 1604 and Highway 87 on the southeast side. Investigators say the man was visiting someone there when he was shot and killed. As Katrina Weber reports, they're still trying to determine who pulled the trigger and why. crime scene tape shows a home on DeBose Road is off limits. That's because a man who had visited people here earlier somehow was shot. Bear County Sheriff's deputies responded to a call from the subdivision near Loop 1604 and Highway 87 just before 11 last night. They say they were told there had been an argument in that home that escalated, resulting in the shooting. The man who the medical examiner identified as 24 year old Josh Fowler was rushed to a hospital but died of his wounds later. According to deputies, there were other people in or around the home at the time. But those investigators weren't able to say how the shooting happened or who it was who pulled out the gun. Deputies did take several people from the house in for questioning, but as of late this morning, a spokesman told me that investigation is still going on, and he says so far no one has been arrested. Reporting from downtown, Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio police trying to track down a man they say robbed a smoke shop on the northeast side late last night. It happened in the 1300 block of Austin Highway around 930. Officers say the suspect walked into the tobacco house, pointed a gun at the person behind the counter and then demanded money. Once he got the cash, he ran off. Police searched the area on the ground and from the air, but did not have any luck. As COVID cases climb, so do the number of people in local hospitals, bringing down the number of available beds. As of last night's numbers, less than 9% of staffed hospital beds were available. Our Garrett Berger talks with the head of the Southwest Texas Regional Advisory Council, or STRAC, about what kind of danger that presents. COVID-19 hospitalizations in Bear County continue to climb yesterday reaching 646. But the executive director of STRAC, which tracks the number of available hospital beds, says Bear County has seen worse. Our top number that I recall was 1267. 
So that gives you the benchmark of where we got back in the summer, you know, and we're at about half that. But more patients coming in still means fewer beds available. Beds not only for severe COVID patients, but also those with more commonplace emergencies, like a heart attack. It's not only for people who may get COVID that it creates a problem. It creates a problem for someone who could have a medical emergency but doesn't have COVID, and there's simply no room in the end. Right now, Epley says Bear County is still doing okay, and the hospitals know how to scale up if needed. Nurses and respiratory therapists can be brought in through a state contract to help staff more beds at local hospitals. And the alternate care site at Freeman Coliseum, which hasn't yet been used, is available too. It's in a warm state, so the, the nursing <laughs> staff from the contractor would have to be brought in. Mm-hmm. But it's it's physically set up. It's able to be turned on in, in hours if needed. Gotcha. Epley says the region around Bear County looks similar. He expects hospitalizations to keep rising here. But by how much is the real question. I don't know if it's going to be a steep increase or a gradual increase. I'm hoping for gradual. Uh, we plan for steep. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Let's take you outside now for a quick look at the roadways. This is a time saver traffic shot of I-10 and Callahan. This is looking east. As you can see, there's some heavy traffic headed onto the flyover there, but otherwise all clear in this area. As the world grapples with COVID-19, ventilators and ECMO machines, a group of patients who have spent their lives struggling to breathe just got new recommendations. San Antonio asthma specialist Dr. Edward Brooks was on the National Institutes of Health expert panel. Ursula Perry explains how the battle to breathe has some new weapons. The 25 million asthmatics in the U.S. can take a collective sigh of relief. Corticosteroid inhalers that were used daily as a long-term management tool are now recommended for asthma attack situations as well. Um, And but there was quite a bit of research that if you use those medications as needed, Um, during a flare-up of your asthma, they were quite effective. For the first time, allergy shots also got a shot in the arm by the experts who now recommend them for allergy-related asthma. But the biggest news is the recommendation of two new devices. One does a fractional exhaled nitric oxide test. The elevation of nitric oxide correlates with the type of inflammation that we see in asthma. So it can help guide your therapy and determine, you know, if you're on the right track, so to speak. The other is called bronchial thermoplasty, a bit more controversial, but it's now recommended as a treatment for adults. A bronchoscopy where they, you know, put a tube down the throat and under anesthesia, and then they warm up or heat these uh, tubes, if you will, and it basically cooks the inflammation. And uh, a whole lot of research has shown that this can be beneficial. There are several more recommendations by Brooks's expert panel at the NIH. Among them, the obvious, how to get rid of the allergens in your home that may trigger those asthma attacks. Among the practices and products discussed, air purifiers. If you want to see the complete list, look for this story on our website, ksat.com. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Animal Care Services offering pet adoptions at reduced prices this holiday season. It's called the Empty the Shelter event. It runs from now through December 13th. You can take home a dog for $25, a cat for $15. Now, even though a new pet can make a great present, ACS does want everyone to remember that owning a pet is a long-term commitment. When you adopt a pet, a pet is family. Before adopting a pet, understanding that a pet is a lifelong commitment. If you're interested, you're going to need to make an appointment, but you can do that on ACS's page on the city's website. Take a live look outside now with live cam. Yet another beautiful sunset on this Wednesday evening as we sit at 72 degrees. And I like that clear sky because it's going to be very beneficial for our space station flyover. 623 p.m. It's only going to last six minutes. Look to the north northwest at 623. All right, 80 degrees, that was our high temperature today after a morning low of 41. So about a 40 degree temperature spread. Big swing from the morning into the afternoon. We're gonna see those temperature spreads start to shrink down here the next couple of days. Not as big of a gap. 70 Rio Medina now, 69 Stinson, we're 69 in New Braunfels, 66 in Hondo, 72 officially at the airport in San Antonio and Del Rio at 73. As we go through the evening, temperatures just gradually falling off. We'll be in the mid 50s by 10 p.m. Midnight still about 50 degrees. And I think everybody is going to stay above freezing tonight, even in the hill country. 
in the upper 30s around San Antonio, 45 degrees tomorrow morning. We'll start the day with a lot of sunshine. Then comes sunset. The clouds are going to be increasing and that's going to lead to a little bit of dampness as we get into Friday morning. It will be well into the 70s again tomorrow, and I think despite a better chance of rain now Friday morning, it will still make it into the 70s by Friday afternoon. So temperatures remaining on the mild side the next couple of days. Those rain chances up a little bit. We have met 40% Friday. That's mainly for the first half of the day. Some drizzle, some fog, and some sp passing light showers periodically for the Friday morning commute up through about the lunch hour, and we could use the rain. The aquifer down eight tenths of a foot today. We're eight feet below the average for this time of year. As for the pollen count, just mold. It's low at 240. We had mountain cedar briefly appear in the pollen count a while back, but we haven't seen it in several days now, but we know that's just a matter of time. We're going to talk about a bigger temperature drop that happens this weekend and beyond coming right up. We have had a week of really bad news in terms of the numbers as we've seen them increasing ever much more as we uh, head into the holiday season. Yeah, but yesterday you saw Metro Health issue their amended directive basically after schools were deemed to be in the red zone. Let's see the latest update now from City Hall. Epidemiology for San Antonio Metro Health, and this is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. Tonight we're reporting 730 new cases of COVID-19, which brings our total to 90,220 since this pandemic began. That is 564 fewer cases than yesterday, uh, but the seven-day daily average remains more than 1,000 cases. Of the 90,220 total cases, 9,426 are active COVID cases, or 11% of the total. That means 89% of the cases have recovered from the virus according to our estimates. Uh, fortunately, we have no new deaths to report tonight, uh, but we know this has been a very deadly pandemic in our community. Uh, so please keep those families and friends and neighbors in your prayers who have lost what loved ones. There are far too many of us that have been hurting from the loss of a loved one due to this pandemic, and please remember them as we go through this holiday season. However, the number of COVID-19 hospitalizations, which is a key indicator of the progression of this virus, continues to rise. We have 663 patients in the hospital night, which is up 17 from yesterday. We only have 15 remaining patients from the El Paso area. That means we did have 76 new COVID-19 related admissions to our area hospitals overnight. 226 people are in the ICU this evening and 119 are on ventilators. Let me turn it over now to Judge Wolf. Yeah, thank Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let, let me thank uh, everybody that's been doing the testing. Uh, we were told earlier today that there's been about 678,000 tests given since we started, of which about 270,000 were done by the fire department. Uh, about 118 or thousand of those were out at the Bear County ground. So that's a hard, lot of hard work they're doing, and I want to thank all of them for the tremendous work, and we're doing more testing every day as we go along. I was reading the paper this morning and something just really struck me. Uh, before his death this last Friday, the Senator Larry Dixon out of Alabama, from his deathbed, asked his wife, sweetheart, we messed up. We just dropped our guard. We've got to tell people this is real. I thought, Golly, that really tugged at me, and at the same time, anger came out, too, when you hear people saying this was all a hoax, when you hear people telling, oh, this, uh, this will be over as soon as the pre presidential election's over with, when people gather in front of the governor's um, uh, <laughs> place in, in, in Austin and uh, uh, chastise him for trying to save people because he did a face mask requirement, it just, it just angers me so much to have no respect for these people that have suffered so much and people that have uh, passed away. Uh, but that really sort of tugged at me. Honey, we made a, we really messed up. So don't mess up. Uh, let's be sure we all keep our guards up and that we're, we're, doing, we're doing the right thing to make it happen. I think we'll have an update on the, on the uh, vaccine here in a minute, but uh, 
Things are really looking promising on that and some really good studies done on the Pfizer one saying that even after the first shot, shot you're beginning to get some protection. So uh, we're excited to see that beginning to start here in a few more days. Thank you very much, Judge. And yes, as, as we reported last night, there will be the first phase of vaccines coming to our community, hopefully next week. Uh, our tier one uh, healthcare workers, frontline workers will start to receive the vaccine. A uh, shipment of approximately 24,000 is scheduled to our area for 10 providers in the hospital, area, uh, hospital systems. Uh, so that marks the important beginning of the vaccination process. And we want to encourage you uh, to know that uh, this is a very rigorous scientific process here in the United States. It will be a safe vaccine. So as you get the word uh, from your medical providers, I want you to know that uh, those vaccines will be made available hopefully sometime in 2021. Uh, so prepare for that. And you can prepare best for that by keeping your guard up, as the judge said. Uh, it is always darkest before dawn, and we know there is a tremendous amount of transmission occurring right now. So please keep your mask on as you leave your house. Make sure you keep six feet of distance between yourself and people who do not live in your household and certainly practice safe hygiene. Want to also appeal to uh, you if you're able to make a donation of blood. There's a critical shortage of blood in our community and the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center is in desperate need of blood supplies and you can schedule a donation yourself by going to southtexasblood.org. In particular, they need type O blood, the universal type, uh, to help uh, prepare uh, for surgeries, for trauma care and all the other uses of blood for medical uh, providing in, in our community community. All right, the numbers are still high, but they're not what we have seen over the past few days. Just 730 new cases today, bringing the total over 90,000 to 90,220. The seven day average still at 1,004 average per 24 hours. Yeah, and the numbers in our hospitals rose slightly. We're now at 663 hospitalizations. Of course, you heard the judge there talk about and warning folks not to let your guard down. Yeah. We are still in the midst of this and a tremendous amount of transmission is happening right now. Luckily, no new deaths, but you did hear some emotion in the county judge's voice there where he was talking about people uh, in his opinion, not respecting those lives, lo lives lost when you talk about it being a hoax and not real. All right, so we're going to have our coronavirus conversation coming up at 630. But right now, let's flip over to weather quickly and get an update on the cold front we're expecting, Adam. Yeah, we're going to see a series of uh, cold fronts that are going to combine into a significant temperature drop in the days ahead. I do want to point out that just a few minutes away, we've got this space station flyover. You can see it very briefly just for six minutes starting at 623. It's going to appear to the north northwest in the sky. All right, let's talk about our rain chances. We've got this system near the bottom. Baja Peninsula. It's going to be headed our way over the coming days and tomorrow's going to be another sunny day. Pleasant, somewhat spring like again, well into the 70s. But then once we get the effects of this upper system and it's associated weak cold front, you'll notice it first thing Friday morning. And I like the way our future cast handles the situation here. Early Friday morning, some drizzle, maybe some areas of fog, and then some scattered light showers, maybe a brief thunderstorm. Here and there across South Texas, we could see up to a quarter of an inch in some lucky locations. So this isn't a drought denting rainfall, but it's better than nothing. This will last through about the noon hour, and then into the afternoon, you see that sky clears from the west to the east, and it's going to set the stage for a beautiful Friday evening. Good for Friday night football 45 tomorrow morning, sunny and 75 into the afternoon, increasing clouds later in the day. That's going to lead to that damp Friday morning with those areas of light rain. And then by the Friday evening commute, just fine. A clear sky. Everything's going to dry out into the weekend. We see temperatures drop back into the 60s, but then really fall off. We're talking low 60s Sunday and by Monday, only upper 50s and that's with sunshine. So real fall like conditions and winter like conditions are on the way. Yeah, Roddy, thanks so much, Adam. All right, so the Spurs rookie has now joined Greg Popovich's team after coming from Coach K's team. That's Two great coaches Isn't that there. pretty darn cool yeah. going from Coach K to Coach Pop? Yes, Trey Jones certainly living out a dream when it comes to his basketball career. Coming up, he was asked about his wow moment since joining the NBA and the Houston Texans are talking with Spurs CEO R.C. Buford. We got it. Coming up. This Essay Salutes Holiday Greeting is brought to you by CPS Energy. Hi, I'm Missy with CPS Energy, scheduled at Eastside Service District. Want to say thank you to all of our first responders, 
I'm wearing red in support of our troops who have yet to make it back home. Thank you and happy holidays. We can't control the Rice UAB game. We can put on Rice cheerleading outfits with pom poms and jump up and down and cheer all we want to. It's, it's really not going to matter. Now that would be a sight to see. Coach Trailer and the Roadrunners are rooting for Rice in big board sports. Spurs 2020 second round draft pick Trey Jones is having a blast while he's getting ready for his first NBA campaign. Selected 41st overall, Jones said the biggest challenge for him so far is the physicality at this level. And with his last college basketball game some nine months ago, he's trying to get back into playing shape to help improve his cardio. The 20 year old says he's already had a wow moment. The first practice for sure. Um, you know, I locked in and there's, um, you know, Got a, got a few all-stars out there. Got some guys that have been um, in the league since um, I've been watching. And so uh, having those, just going into practice with those guys, but also um, Coach Pop, you know, uh, one, of the, one of, if not the greatest coach um, at this level to do it. Um, I mean, just having him coaching you as well, I think that was just uh, one of those moments where, where I just realized that. And here's some pictures from Spurs media day today. Rookies Devin Vassell and Trey Jones in the Spurs awesome looking Fiesta jersey. And how about the trio of Patty Mills, DeMar DeRozan and DeJounte Murray. So this Saturday, the UTSA Roadrunners will find out if they'll get to play in the Conference USA Football Championship December 18th. Their fate will be decided in Houston when Rice plays host to UAB Saturday at noon. Al's win, the Roadrunners will represent the West for the CUSA title. If, UA, if UAB wins, they'll get the nod. UTSA head coach Jeff Trailer was asked if he thought about getting the team together with social distancing in mind to watch that UAB-Rice matchup. We did, but it's just this year, I'm terrified right now of the COVID. It's such an outbreak right now. Um, I want those guys away from each other, get away from me, don't be inside. You know, if I had a giant screen TV on the practice field, maybe, and we were all scattered out of the whole deal, I'd consider it. But that deal's popping up so much everywhere. Uh, I just don't want our guys to get get hit with it. So we decided not to do that. It would be a great idea. It would have been a lot of fun in a normal year. Uh, to get the guys together. Coach also said because of COVID-19, he feels bowl games will be regionally decided, so he's looking at Frisco, Dallas, or Fort Worth, and will be shocked if that's not the case. And the University of the Incarnate Word football game at Arkansas State on Saturday has been canceled due to COVID-19 related issues within the Cardinals program. UIW is scheduled to play February 20th when they host Sam Houston State at Benson Stadium. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Houston Texans owner Cal McNair is turning to Spurs CEO R.C. Buford to assist in searching for a new head coach and general manager, as reported by John McClain of the Houston Chronicle. He says Buford is part of a star-studded cast, including Hall of Fame football coaches Tony Dungy and Jimmy Johnson, Texans all-time receiving leader Andre Johnson, and Fritz Pollard Alliance Executive Director Rod Graves, who spent 37 years in the NFL. McNair needs to fix his fractured front office and will rely heavily on these advisors during his search. All right, let's go out to the newsroom now for Steve and EC's guys. Thank you, Larry. Our KSAT COVID conversation begins right after the break. Reading, writing, and red zones. We are talking about COVID-19 and the effect on education in South Texas right now in the past and where we're going in the future. It's our live town hall conversation that we're going to have from 630 until 8 o'clock. The first part is online and on air here on KSAT 12, where it is in conjunction with Trinity University. want to welcome Dr. Enrique Alamon, the Director of Educational Leadership, that program at Trinity University. Dr. Alamon, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. I want to start with Put yourself in the position of superintendents in the many different school districts that we have. Are you between a rock and a hard place right now when you see that we're in the red zone when it comes to Metro Health? Metro Health asking schools to go to virtual learning, but the TEA telling schools they can't go to virtual learning right now or they could be punished financially? 
Yeah, they're they're in a quite a precarious situation, and, and they've really been in that situation since March. Really, when this started in March, it's it's been evolving, and they've had to really uh, adapt and continue to shift their strategies. And so they are in a situation where they're having to advocate for their communities, and they're having to take uh, the the best health and ad- academic needs into, under consideration for the students and the families that they work with. At the same time, you have a state a state legislature, a state government that. Is, is really putting the mandates down pretty hard on them. So they're having to adapt as they go and, and as we go into, tw- into, into 2021. You, we also heard the argument from a lot of superintendents yesterday saying that a lot of transmission is not necessarily happening in schools. Um, you know, again, to that question and, and to piggyback off of um, Steve's question, how do, you, how do you balance those two things? And as they're looking into the spring semester and how to move forward after Christmas, what should they be looking at as they make those decisions? That's a great question. I mean, I think when we work with our students and we have a lot of great partnerships with our school districts here around Bear County, um, the more that you can include different constituencies as part of that conversation, I mean, I think teachers need to be part of that conversation. Obviously, parents and families need to be part of that conversation. And as much as possible, especially in high school level, bring in youth to really have conversations about ways of moving forward. Schools at the, at, at the heart are parts of our community. They're actually the center of our community. And, and the more that we can kind of build community by having conversations about ways of moving forward, I think that's, that's just a great way of, of, of doing it. See, I love the fact that in, you brought up those different factions up because we're going to have parents, we're going to have teachers, we're going to have administrators, obviously professors, educators, uh, as part of this conversation tonight. But, you know, you're also talking about just in San Antonio, just in the San Antonio area, you talked about being advocates for the community. I mean, you've got so many different school districts here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think 17 uh, different school districts that count, that touch Bear County, and they're all very diverse, have very d- different demographics. Obviously, San Antonio historically has, has, uh, has come from segregation, uh, school inequity, uh, kinds of concerns and so I think that those are those are lingering effects that we continue to deal with um, I still have a lot of hope though I mean I think you know it feels like people are coming together and there's more of a conversation happening and and really getting back to the basics at, at the core education is about caring it's about humanizing it's, it's a humanizing business of anything it's about relationship building and so this this time period that we're living through has made it very difficult in the sense that we're not together um, and the more that we can do, you know, use virtual means, but also as we come out of the pandemic, to figure out ways to continue to build our communities and, and schools are being a ma- major part of that. You mentioned school inequities, and I want to touch on that really quickly. You know, school districts are so different in di- and diverse, not only in terms of the makeup of the schools and those districts, but also in terms of resources. What advice and guidance can you share for school leaders of underprivileged communities, maybe those who don't have that wide ex- access to technologies and things like that during the pandemic? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Again, San Antonio is really the, the center of a lot of the school funding, school and equity cases that have come out from the state. Uh, the families and the communities here have always fought and advocated for more equity. Um, without having a, a bunch of money coming your way i think one way that we look at it is you know our families and our students and our history is part of our wealth uh, how do we tap into those resources family resources uh community knowledge um as we as we ask the legislature to continue to fund our schools the way they should be funded there's also these types of assets community cultural wealth and community cultural assets that are that are part of our that are part of San Antonio that that uh, it's another kind of way of kind of tapping into that resource. We're going to continue our conversation with Dr. Enrique Aleman and we're going to add a student to the conversation as well when we come back. Welcome back. We just heard before the break a little bit from Dr. Enrique Aleman, who is director of the Educational Leadership Program at Trinity University. We want to bring someone else into the conversation right now. We want to introduce you to Jalen Harris. He is a Trinity senior and Student Government Association president. Jalen, thank you so much for joining us. We know you're studying for finals right now, so we appreciate your time. And I I just want to start with a question on a lot of students' minds. What has remote learning been like for you during this pandemic? Remote learning, I mean, to be quite honest, it's different. It's not quite like um, being in the classroom. 
And I think that I'm encouraged by the professors, the administrators that I've spoken to, been in the classroom with, who are leading this moment with compassion, um, the, the moment that students are in. And I think that across the board, top down, that should be the attitude of, of all institutions, including Trinity. So I'm definitely encouraged by um, the professors that I've come across, but I definitely feel for those students and want to give a voice to those students who might feel that that's not, that has not been their experience in the classroom and, and really get that message out there. This is not, I'm guessing, how you envisioned your senior year at Trinity University. I mean, you're the president of uh, the Student Association as well, is that right? Yes, I am. So, I mean, how have you been coping? and What is helping you through this very unusual senior year of yours? Me personally, I uh, come from a Baptist background, so I have faith in wherever I am, I'm, I'm meant to be. Whatever I'm going through, I can look at it and say, this too shall pass. But it, it is tough, and I, I want to give voice to that. It, it's, it's tough. And one thing that's definitely sustained me is just keeping up with friends from a, a, a distant way, talking on the phone with them, and just... Jalen, we're having a little trouble. We're having a little trouble hearing you. I don't, I don't know if uh, something might have covered your microphone there or something. Let's try it again. <laughs> Is that better? Yes. Yeah, much better. Okay. S sorry, yeah. I don't, I, but it, it, I start again and tell me what, how you're getting through this. I mean, obviously your faith, you said, is a big part. Um, just really focusing in on, on trying to finish out this year strong. I, I, I really can't give um, any, it, it's hard to give advice to, to, to anyone out there that, that's going through the same situation because we all handle uh, and are handling this situation differently. And so for me, it's just been a lot of isolation, finding things I like to watch on TV, um, discovering new things, but even in the middle of that, you know, it is definitely tough. You mentioned that a lot of people are handling this differently. As the president of the Student Government Association, what message do you have to other college students, not just at Trinity, but throughout San Antonio? One thing I want to say is that we all know what we need to do, and, and we all know right from wrong, and but getting a control over this situation is up to us. So we need to continue to focus on physical distancing, wearing a mask, trying to limit how much we travel. Um, and one thing that I'll say is that our best tool that we have, especially for us college age students, is that we are the best at convincing each other. And so we need to continue to peer pressure, remind our friends to be safe, not only for themselves, but for those around them. Um, I definitely feel for the, the, the amount of loss um, that so many families out there are feeling right now. I mean, it's hard to put words to it. Um, but I think that's why we need to all focus on doing our part and, and trying to do it better, not only for ourselves, again, but for each other. We're all in this together. Jalen Harris, senior at Trinity University. Stay with us. We're going to take another break. We'll be right back. We are back now with a quick segment with Dr. Enrique Alamon from Trinity University, the Director of Educational Leadership, and Jalen Harris, who is a senior at Trinity University. And Dr. Alamon, what do you want people at home to know tonight? I think that, uh, well, Jalen mentioned it earlier. I mean, I think there, there are certain steps that we can take to you know, really help our community get through this. And the more that we can kind of follow those steps and think of our neighbors, uh, you know, everybody's struggling right now. San Antonio, we've seen the food lines. We've seen how people have struggled across the city. Uh, the more that we can kind of come together as a community, I think we can get through this and, and, and moving forward. I think for educators and educational leaders, they're planners by nature. They're in, and with all this uncertainty, you know, they're trying to do the best that they can. I talk to principals all the time. They're really struggling. They're tired but they have the community at heart and they're trying to do the best that they can uh, to get through this and get our communities through it. Jalen, I wanna ask my next question to you. Can you give our viewers or offer our viewers some perspective on what campus life looks and feels like right now? Are most of the kids virtual or some on campus? Kind of walk us through what it's like right now. Yeah, so so here at Trinity, we do have a hybrid model where, where we are offering some core, core courses in person and so I've actually attended some in-person classes and it's it's very different um, everyone of course is wearing their mask um, when appropriate and being in the classroom you know there's a bit more 
silence to it than it normally is. I think one thing that this moment reminds us is that it's those passing moments with our friends, um, seeing each other in the classroom that really sustains us, that really plays a role in our performance in the classroom, um, our mental health, our attitude just toward learning in general. And so I think that we all need to dig deep inside of ourselves and, and, and really band together and, and fight our way through this. Mm -hmm. But as far as on campus, it, it, it does look different, but we are doing our best. I want to remind you that uh, this is a conversation that we want you to be a part of too. Those of you who are watching on KSAT, on KSAT.com or on the Tiger Network, on Trinity's uh, uh, website. We all want you to join in this conversation. We've got some great questions coming in. Uh, again, at 7 o'clock, we're going to continue this online only on KSAT.com and on the Trinity Network. Uh, we will be joined by three other panelists who will give us their perspective on how this whole thing is shaping up. We're going to take another quick break and we'll be right back. Welcome back to our COVID conversations. We have just heard from Dr. Enrique Aleman and Jalen Harris with Trinity University. We are now joined by three new panelists. We can introduce them really quickly. We have Tess Cudi Anders, who is Vice President and of Strategic Communications and Marketing. We've also got uh, Rocio Delgado, Associate Professor of Education and Director of the Empatico Program, as well as Diana Kenny, who is Interim Director of the Education School Psychology Program. Thank you again to our panelists for joining us this evening. Our focus, education and COVID, and a question that we've been getting over and over online, even as this live stream has been going, is should I feel safe sending my kids back to school right now? And, and Tess, I know that you wanted to, uh, I'm giving you first crack at this or putting you on the hot seat first here to talk mm -hmm. about this from a higher education standpoint. Sure, sure, happy to do that. I mean, as a parent of college age children, uh, students, uh, myself, I understand that concern. And, you know, I think uh, in San Antonio, what I've seen from our peer institutions that each are doing an exceptional job of putting uh, the programs and initiatives in place to create a safe environment. But there are some questions that I would ask wherever I'm, I'm sending my student. And, and the first is, what are the multi-layered things that the institution is doing to prevent, to mitigate the spread of the disease and to catch it early and then contain it? And so the kinds of questions you wanna ask are, what sorts of early warning systems do you have? Are you asking students, faculty and staff to do a health check, a health screening every day? and then asking them not to come to campus or admit them to campus if they fail that health check? Are you doing multiple kinds of testing? For example, surveillance testing, where you're kind of looking to catch the virus early in your population, as well as symptomatic or on-demand testing on your campus. And then what kinds of quarantine isolation and contact tracing programs do you have in place? So it's really critical that a university or a college has some resources, internal or external, that help contact trace, almost like a little town. We've been calling it Town Trinity. So it's our responsibility to contact trace any exposure or positive case to try to ensure the safety of, of anyone impacted. And so having aggressive resources in place to do that. And then lastly, once students have to, you know, should you have to be in quarantine because you were exposed or isolate, because uh, you've become positive, do you have the clinical team and clinical resources to ensure that a student's daily needs and clinical needs are being met? And so just ask those questions and make sure you understand where those resources are coming from and how they're being delivered. And now that we have an entire fall to look back on, you can ask for a track record on that. And I think if you can get the right answers to those questions, you can feel as confident as, as anyone would or could send your student to school. And at the end of the day, what I've heard from epidemiologists is, you know, this is gonna be with us for a while. It'll take a little while for the vaccine to, to begin to be implemented and, and take effect. And we have to live our lives. And we don't wanna let our educations and, you know, the incredible career that uh, individuals like Jalen are gonna have be put on hold. And so let's work together to put the safety mechanisms and mitigation strategies in place to keep moving on and keep moving forward. 
We have so much ground to cover tonight. We are just getting started. Our conversation is going to move online here at the seven o'clock hour. We're going to be from seven to eight. We invite you to send us some questions either on social media. I know on the Trinity University website, we're also fielding some questions. So please join us as our conversation continues online on KSAT.com. We'll see you back here on the night beat at 10. And of course, we're going to go to KSAT.com and Trinity's website right after the break. COVID and its effect on education in our community is what we're going to be talking about tonight as we continue this conversation online. We're joined by five very esteemed panelists who will be taking your questions and our questions and kind of leading us through the conversation this evening into how this pandemic is being dealt with in our classrooms. Yeah, and we certainly appreciate your time for joining us. Again, this is this conversation is going to move online right now to ksat.com. Send us your questions. We've received quite a few already that are really good. So um, again, send us your questions and we will post those to the panelists. See you on the night beat at 10.